Hello students, this video is going to step you through two example problems which you requested from chapter 5 in night. So we'll be looking at 5.1 number 8 and 5.3 number 31. So let's take a look at number 8. Uh, we have a 65 kilogram student walking on a slack line, so uh, kind of like a rope stretched between two trees. The line stretches and so has a noticeable sag as shown in figure P 5.8 and we can see that over here the line is sagging at the point where his foot touches the line the rope applies a tension force in each direction as shown what is the tension in the line okay and this uh, gets at um, some of the concepts in chapter 5 and in chapter 5.1 we are mainly concerned about static equilibrium that means we have something standing still and it's in equilibrium, so everything should be balanced. And uh, this is a case of that. So I'm going to begin by drawing a diagram, which is the first thing I want. I have a nice um, pictorial diagram up here. So that's great. It helps me as a reference. If I did not have that pictorial diagram, I'd want to draw it, just to be sure that I know uh, what I'm talking about. But in this case, let's do a physics representation. Let's do a physics diagram. And with forces, the best physics diagram we can do is, of course, a free body diagram. So let's do that. Um, we have an object. Uh, we have this student. There is a force uh, pointing down due to gravity. Okay, That is the force of the Earth acting on the student, Fg. And there are two other forces acting on the student, uh, one is this tension force going off over here at some angle. And we have that same tension force going off on the other side. And they both make an angle with the horizontal uh, of 20 degrees. So I'm going to write that under here with my knowns. I know the mass of the student is 65 kilograms. And I know that this angle is 20 degrees. Okay, so this is my problem setup. The next thing I want to do is write principles. What are some principles that are going to help me here? Principles. Okay, well, if it's in static equilibrium, this is the definition static equilibrium, well, then we shouldn't be moving because we're static, we're in equilibrium. So all forces, the sum of all forces should equal zero. Uh, and, and this symbol right here, sigma, that's the Greek letter sigma, the thing that kind of looks like a jagged E. Uh, and sigma just means sum. Sum means we add them all up. So if I take the vector sum, if I add up all the force vectors on this object, I should get zero because everything needs to balance. OK, so let's split this up. The next thing that we can do is uh, split this problem up into uh, two separate problems, one for the horizontal, one for the vertical. So I can make a statement that the sum of forces in the x direction should equal 0, and the sum of forces in the y direction should also equal 0. If I want everything to balance out, this rope better be able to hold the weight of the student. Okay, other things I know, uh, how am I going to find that downward force? The weight on any object is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, and that's going to be Fg. So this is, this is the setup to my problem. Once now that I've written all this down, I can actually begin solving. So let's um, start off with the x direction. And I'm going to do the x direction, the horizontal direction, in blue. Let's make a statement about the sum of the forces in the x direction. We know it should end up equaling 0. And if I add up all my forces, let's see, I've got uh, the tension force over here can be split into Tx. And it looks like this is also Tx, Tx. And let's do the y direction in red so we can keep it separate. Here's Ty, and here's Ty. OK, so if I'm going to sum up the forces in the x direction, uh, I want to get uh, Tx. Um, 
minus tx equals 0. Well, that's not very surprising. Uh, tx minus tx equals 0. So that's not going to be very useful to me, but let's write it down anyway as a statement of things that we know. Uh, let's try in the y direction. I know that this should also equal 0 because i got to add up to static equilibrium. And it looks like, let's see, what do I have in the vertical direction? I have a ty. I have another ty because the tension on the rope is acting on both sides. And I have a minus fg equals the weight. And I know that if I combine um, terms, I, this, this right here is going to become 2ty. And if I draw a triangle, if I draw a triangle, because these are not perfectly um, vertical or horizontal forces, excuse me, let me use green for my triangle so that we have a different color. If I have this vector t, I know I can split it into t, uh, tx and ty, and I can set up trigonometric relations between these uh, between these components. I know that opposite over adjacent, excuse me, opposite over hypotenuse, ty over t should equal the sine of this angle theta, and I know that adjacent tx over hypotenuse, which is t, should equal the cosine of that angle. So I can make a substitution here because I don't know what ty is, but I can substitute uh, for things uh, that I want to know. I want to know t. What is the tension in the line is the question that we are asked. What is the tension in the line? We're looking for t. So let's put these in terms of t. T sine theta, and that's going to be 2t sine theta because there's two of them. I can combine terms. So 2t sine theta minus fg equals 0. And uh, as I'm looking at this, I'm noticing that I, I can figure out what fg is. I know what um, theta is. I know what the angle is. And my only unknown in this equation is t. So this looks very promising. Let's move fg to the other side. So 2t sine theta equals fg. And uh, let's see. I need to divide by 2 sine theta to get t by itself. So t equals fg 2 sine theta. Remember, we want to solve it symbolically before we plug in any numbers so that we can see relationships between variables. So t equals fg sine theta. And uh, I still I don't know what fg is. I have to put it in terms of what I know. So let me make one last substitution. I know that fg, the weight, is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So I finally can express this. The tension in the rope should be equal to mg over 2 sine theta. That's my symbolic solution. So now we can finally plug in what it is we want, or excuse me, what it is that we know. So let's plug in our known uh, variables. Let's go back up here to my list of knowns. Uh, I saw that mass is equal to 65 kilograms in the problem. So let's put that up here on the numerator. 65 uh, times 9.8, we can round to 10. Over 2 times the sine of 20 degrees. Okay, we can uh, plug that in. And uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, 65 times 10 is 650. 2 times the sine of 20 degrees is uh, 0 0.684. And if I divide those two out, I get about 950. And our units of force are newtons. OK, so quick recap on this problem. Uh, the first thing I did was set up my diagram and my principles. I drew a free body diagram because there are forces involved. And uh, the best diagram that we can use anytime forces are involved is a free body diagram. I made sure to include my angles, all the forces acting on the object. 
Uh, I listed my knowns down here, the mass and the angle. Uh, I made uh, some statements of principles. I know that if this is in static equilibrium, then the sum of all the forces should add up to zero, which means both of my components, fx and fy, should be zero. Um, I did fy in red. Let's put a little red dot there. Uh, I knew that I could split up any vector into its components that are perfectly in the x direction, perfectly in the y direction, and that weight is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Right there, at this point, the physics ends. Everything above this point is the physics. Okay, if you if you can't do that, that is the actual most important part of the problem. Because once we have this, everything else is just algebra. Uh, we can write our equations in uh, both directions, horizontal and vertical. Uh, in this case, the vertical direction gave us the most useful information. We solved for our unknown value, t, in terms of only known values on the right-hand side, mass, acceleration due to gravity, which is just a constant, times 2, uh, excuse me, divided by 2 times the sine of the angle, which is also known. Plugged in what we knew, and we get a solution. The tension in the rope is about 950 newtons. Okay, let's take a look at the other question that you requested. Uh, this is a great problem, uh, problem 31, three striper. Uh, we have a 10 kilogram crate placed on a horizontal conveyor belt, and the materials are such that the static coefficient of friction is 0.5, and the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, is 0 0.30. We are asked to draw a free body diagram showing all the forces on the crate if the conveyor belt runs at a constant speed. Draw a free body diagram showing all the forces on the crate if the conveyor belt is speeding up. What is the maximum acceleration the belt can have without the crate slipping? And D, if the acceleration of the belt exceeds the value determined in part C, what is the acceleration of the crate? Wow, lots of parts to that problem. Let's go through it step by step using our same method. So uh, in this problem, because there's so much going on with two different objects, I'm actually not going to jump right to drawing a free body diagram. I'm just going to make a quick sketch of the situation so that I can visualize what's going on. So let me put over here diagram. And here's my conveyor belt, and there's my crate. And the crate should be moving along with the conveyor belt. So if, if I'm thinking about this crate as my uh, system, so system meaning I'm only going to consider what's inside of that dotted line. My system is the crate, because that's what I'm going to draw the free body diagram for. If I consider that the crate, as far as it knows, there is no motion between that crate and the conveyor belt, uh, assuming that it's not slipping, which it seems like we can safely assume because part C here says, what is the maximum acceleration the belt can have without the crate slipping? Later on, let's deal with the fact that it might be slipping. But for right now, um, we can say that it's not slipping at all. So to this crate, between this crate and the conveyor belt, there should be no motion between it and the conveyor belt. Relative to the conveyor belt, it should be at rest, which is kind of an interesting thought. So let's put some principles down. Principles. Uh, crate is at rest relative to the belt even though the belt is moving, even though the belt is moving, the only thing I'm concerned about is this this object right here, this crate right here. And the only object that that crate is touching is the belt. It is not moving relative to the belt. So it's going to behave as if it were at rest, because it is at rest relative to the belt. Let me remind myself of the fact that a free body diagram only shows the forces acting on 
the object or system of interest. Okay, so I'm not thinking about forces on the belt. I'm not thinking about forces on the earth. I'm not thinking about forces on anything else except for this crate. This is going to help me uh, draw this free body diagram. And just to make it clear, let me say move together. And no slip. Okay, I have some reminders now uh, to myself so that I can accurately draw uh, these free body diagrams. Okay, let's take a look. Draw a free body diagram showing all the forces on the crate if the conveyor belt runs at constant speed. So here's A. I need to draw a free body diagram. Well, let me start with my object. It's a dot. Okay, things I know, things I get for free is the force of the earth on the crate. We can call that FG or W for the weight as used in the book. That's fine. I know, let me draw my horizontal, I know that there's a normal force uh, exerted by the surface on the object perpendicular to the surface. So there's that normal force. And now here's where it gets a little bit tricky and we have to do some thinking about it. Okay, so I need to go back to my principles. The crate is at rest relative to the belt, and the free body diagram only shows the forces acting on the object or system of interest. It would be really, really tempting, and I'm drawing this in red because it's wrong, it would be really tempting to say there's a frictional force over here uh, or force of the conveyor belt or something like that um, to pull us this way, and then friction is balancing us out on the other side, and we end up with a net force of zero. Uh, but that actually cannot happen. And the reason why is that how is the conveyor belt uh, pulling the block? It's pulling it through friction, through static friction. Um, if we were just starting up the belt, and the belt is going to be pulling this crate. Yes, then we need a, a frictional force. It would be a frictional force right here that pulls the crate into motion. But once we're in motion, and it says that we're moving at constant velocity, constant velocity, constant velocity, this means that two things. It means that acceleration must be zero, and it means that the sum of the forces must be zero. So if we already use the frictional force over here to be pulling uh, the crate, we can't just make up another frictional force on the other side um, because we're out of forces. There are no other forces left on this object. So actually, in actuality, these are the only forces that are acting on the object uh, on the crate when it is moving along at constant velocity. Uh, and it, and you, you can uh, do this as a thought experiment too. Think about in your head, if you are on a conveyor belt that is moving perfectly smoothly, there's no bumps, there's no hills, nothing like that. If it's moving perfectly smoothly and you close your eyes when you're on that conveyor belt, it will feel as if you are standing still. It will feel as if you're just standing on the ground, uh, which is why this free body diagram looks the way that it does. The only forces that this object is experiencing right now with the conveyor belt moving at constant velocity are the normal force from the surface, which is what you feel on your feet, and uh, the weight of the object, gravity pulling you down. Okay, a little bit tricky, but we have to think about the fact that there's no slip. Okay, B, again, let's think about just our object of interest. Okay, here is my object, there's my horizontal. The two I get for free, I know that it has mass, therefore it has weight. So let's put that one on there. And I know it's touching a surface, so there's my normal force from the surface. Now let's consider what's happening. Okay, it's true that we have no slip between uh, the crate and the conveyor belt. They need to be accelerating forward. 
Uh, and if I'm accelerating, B, draw a free body diagram showing all the forces on the conveyor belt if the conveyor belt is speeding up. If the conveyor belt is speeding up and there's no slip, then the crate better be speeding up as well. So if the crate is speeding up, then I know its acceleration must be in the direction of the movement of the conveyor belt. I have to have an acceleration. If I have an acceleration, then my net force better be in that same direction. I have to have a net force to the right. I must have a net force to the right. So where does that net force come from is the next question. Well, it comes from the conveyor belt. I think that's that's pretty intuitive to say that the conveyor belt is pulling the crate. But what kind of force is it? Let's zoom in right here at the boundary between our object of interest, which is the crate, and the other object which is touching it, which is the conveyor belt. If we were the block, the crate, we have inertia. We want to be doing what we do unless a net force makes us do otherwise. There is a frictional force right here that is pulling us in that direction. Okay, We want to stay where we're at. Uh, the motion of the conveyor belt uh, relative to us is forward. We're being pulled along with it through a static frictional force because we're, we're not slipping yet, so we assume we're standing still. This is a static frictional force uh, towards the right. It better be to the right because I know my net force needs to be to the right, and there are no other forces available besides the static frictional force to provide that net force to the right. So my free body diagram looks like this. Okay, and if we want to summarize our thinking, it's right here. That acceleration has to be the right, F, therefore F net has to be to the right, um, static friction from uh, the belt is the only force available to provide the net force. So that's kind of a process of elimination argument, but the other argument works well too. If you think about the fact that if we were the crate hovering above the conveyor belt, if we're hovering above the conveyor belt, the conveyor belt moves this way, it's as if we are moving to the left relative to the conveyor belt. So relative motion between the block and the conveyor belt if we just think about it from the block's perspective, it could just as easily think it's moving to the left relative to some stationary ground. So the friction force right here is going to oppose that relative motion between the objects and drag it forward, uh, which is a little complex, but made of pieces that we already know. Okay, so A and B are taken care of. What is the maximum acceleration the belt can have without the crate slipping? So now, uh, if we want to look at maximum acceleration, we don't want the crate to slip. We don't want the crate to slip. That means that uh, this frictional force right here can be no larger than the maximum static frictional force on the object. We know from studying friction that the maximum the maximum static friction on an object that it can achieve is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And if the uh, static friction uh, is, is the net force on the object that's going to be accelerating it, if this is what results in my net force, then by Newton's second law, this has to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration in the x direction because that is my only force. This is just a statement of Newton's second law where some of the forces in the x direction better be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. The only force I have in the x direction is static friction. 
if the belt is accelerating. And we did that in B. Okay, so let's figure out what this maximum uh, acceleration can be. Uh, I'm going to solve for AX. This is what I want to know. What is that maximum acceleration? So let me do that uh, over here. I'm just going to divide by M. AX equals mu sub S times the normal force divided by M. Now that I have my unknown that I want, AX on the left hand side, and I have nothing but knowns. Oh, actually I don't have nothing but knowns uh, on the right hand side. Do I know what the normal force is? I actually don't yet. Um, but I could figure out what it is from a statement that the box is not accelerating in the y direction. We wrote that down up in our knowns uh, up at the top. We wrote that in our principles uh, that the crate is at rest relative to the belt, which means the sum of forces in either direction should be zero. So if I do that, then I realize that the normal force uh, must be equal to the opposite of uh, the weight of the object. What is the weight of the object? Uh, and it is um, mass times g. I have the mass of the object, uh, oh, 10 kilograms. I actually forgot to write it on my diagram. 10 kg. We were also given static friction at 0 0.50, and the kinetic friction coefficient is 0 0.30. My mistake, I should have put those on the diagram up front so that we have them available. But uh, now we have the mass uh, times uh, acceleration due to gravity is the weight. So uh, let's uh, pull that down here and make our substitution and say that the acceleration in the x direction is equal to the static friction coefficient times the mass times acceleration due to gravity all over the mass. Oh, wow. Well, that's pretty handy because if I have mass over mass, looks like they cancel out. And I don't even need to do the calculation first. If I had just jumped straight to calculating numbers, I would have made a useless calculation. I don't actually need to calculate that because you can see that uh, the mass cancels out. I actually only need to punch in two numbers into my calculator. The acceleration in the x direction, the maximum acceleration that we can achieve, is equal to the static coefficient of friction times g. Okay, if we want to find that exact value, 0 0.50 times 10, 5 uh, point, let's see, I get how many significant figures, looks like I get two, 5.0 meters per second squared. Okay, is the maximum acceleration that I can achieve. Finally, let's consider part D. If the acceleration of the belt exceeds the value determined in part C, what is the acceleration of the crate? So again, let's go back to our diagram here and consider Let's think about physically what is happening. If the belt starts going faster than static friction can hold the crate onto the belt, then we no longer have this assumption of no slip. The, the static friction can no longer hold the crate onto the belt, and the crate is going to start slipping. If the crate is slipping, so let's write down D, crate is now slipping. Okay, now if the crate is slipping, then uh, we can no longer use static friction uh, because static friction means that there, there can't be any motion uh, between the two objects that are rubbing against each other. And now we clearly do have motion, we have slipping. We have to use kinetic friction. So we found, we found a relationship between acceleration and a coefficient of friction. We found it already. It's over here. The only difference for part D is now that we're slipping, we use the coefficient of kinetic friction. Uh, so AX equals mu K times G.
instead of mu s times g. Notice that if we had immediately started doing plug and chug, if we had started punching in numbers immediately right away, and we didn't solve for this first, we would have to punch in all those numbers again for a slightly different problem. Instead, now that we found an analytical solution, we found a relationship between acceleration, the coefficient of friction, and the acceleration due to gravity, now all we need for part D is a one-liner, which is great because this is very straightforward, 0 0.030 times 10. The acceleration of the object is 3.0 meters per second squared. Okay, so there we are. We're done with problem 31. So let's recap really quick uh, on any uh, particularly confusing points. Uh, one, I drew a diagram for myself, a physical diagram, not a free body diagram. I drew myself a little sketch here so that I was sure what system, what object am I actually considering to be of interest. I made myself notes that they move together and that there's no slip. Uh, in Part D, this became not true, but at least for uh, starters, uh, it was a good assumption to say that there's no slip. I wrote down my uh, known information up here. Um, principles, the crate is at rest relative to the belt and I have to remind myself that a free body diagram only shows the forces acting on the object or system of interest. It's really tempting to consider the belt and the crate together and draw some force over here on part A uh, and some force on the back, but that's that's not true. We're only considering this object and I think A uh, was probably the most confusing part of this problem to imagine that even though this object is moving there are actually no forces on it from either side uh, if it's if we just take a picture of it when it's moving along at constant velocity it would feel as if it's standing on flat level uh, an unmoving ground it's only when we go to accelerate it's only when we try and change its state of motion, that we need to have a net force on the object. How does that net force get from the conveyor belt to the object? It must be some sort of frictional force. We're still assuming no slip, so it's the static frictional force. And that's the only force we got. That's the only way that we can provide an acceleration of the object um, in the direction of motion. And then we went to part C, uh, and we uh, laid out our uh, Newton's second law in the horizontal direction. I know that the sum of the forces in the x direction has to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration in the x direction. We're looking for Ax. We know that the maximum force that can be applied before slipping is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. I didn't know what the normal force was, but from doing Newton's second law, in the vertical direction, I know that I need to be in equilibrium in the vertical direction, so I better have my normal force equal to my weight. So if I know my weight, I can just plug that in over here. Substitution of mg in for the normal force. And that gave me something really convenient. I was able to cancel out mass from my equation, which I would not have realized I could do if I just started punching numbers up over here. I solved algebraically first and then was able to cancel out mass and actually get a very simple analytical solution that the maximum acceleration is just equal to the coefficient of static friction times g, which is great. The crate is now slipping in part d. Uh, instead of having to redo everything with a new coefficient of friction, all I did was I took the same analytical relationship, the simple one that we discovered here algebraically, and I changed static friction to kinetic friction because now we're slipping. 0 0.30 times 10 is uh, plus 3.0 meters per second squared. And we have the solution to number 31.